about uh, distinguished trade group, sir, uh, Dr. Anil Kapoor, yes, sir. Mansa will introduce about about you. Over to you, Mansa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a distinct honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Anil Kapoorkar. Uh, Anil Kapoorkar is an Indian nuclear physicist and mechanical engineer. Dr. Anil Kapoorkar, a renowned scientist who put India in the top league of the nuclear capital nations, was awarded the Padma Vibhushan, India's second highest uh, civilian honor in 2009, and the Padma Vibhushan in 1999. He was a part of the core team of architects of India's peaceful nuclear test in 1974 and 1998. He was the director of the Baba Atomic Research Center from May from 1996 to 2000. Since 2000, he has been leading the Atomic Energy Commission of India and also is the secretary of the Department of Atomic Energy. He has published over 250 scientific papers. Dr. Kakotkar has chaired the committee appointed by the government of India to recommend autonomy measures to facilitate the IITs in scaling greater heights. Among many others, he was awarded the FICCI award for outstanding contributions to nuclear engineering and technology, national citizen, uh, citizens award, general president's award of Indian Science Congress, INS Komi Baba Lifetime Achievement Award, and eminent engineer award 2015 by the Engineering Council of India. Uh, thank you very much for your presence, sir. We welcome you. Thank you. Do I start? Yes, yeah, sir. Please. Okay. Can you unshare your? Yeah, I'll share presentation from here. What's happening? I'm not able to share it from here for some reason. Sir, can we do from what side, sir? Oh, I got it. I got it. Are you able to see? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, so, friends, I'm happy to present this uh, second lecture of the three lecture series which I promised to deliver at your college. Uh, today we'll speak on relevance of nuclear energy in achieving net zero emission. Now, uh, as you know, we are all talking about uh, clean and green energy transition. Uh, and uh, sort of we have committed to reach net zero emission by 2070. Now, realizing this target uh, actually needs a major rethink. Uh, because India is still on development path, as you can see on the, uh, on the figure on the top right hand corner of this uh, picture. And uh, 
this is actually a correlation between human development index which is a united nations uh, index that depends on the educational attainment uh, the uh, income as well as the health uh, parameters and on the x axis it is the total energy consumption and if you can as you can see india is uh, what has happened so india is uh, is here uh, uh, which is uh, fairly low in terms of per capita energy consumption and so also it's fairly low in terms of human development index compare that with countries uh, which are on this blue triangle they are they are all developed countries and they are uh, uh, the uh, per capita energy consumption is fairly high uh, beyond a threshold uh, where the human development index is already at the near full value 0.95 or thereabouts and it remains there because there is no no scope for further improvement but for us india the challenge is we have to move from here to at least here and as our economy sort of grows we may also move on this path but uh, as far as human development in this is concerned you know these countries for example some countries which are here if they even if they reduce their per capita energy consumption i think their human development index nothing will happen it will remain of course it will affect economy so the point is that So we have this challenge of uh, reaching, realizing our development at the same time, realizing this development without adding to the uh, emissions. We have to reach the net zero emission by 2070. So India can be expected to surpass annual per capita energy consumption level. necessary to be on par with the best in the world with the countries which are here the threshold per capita energy consumption taking into account improvement of efficiency as a result of clean energy transition could be around 1400 kg oil equivalent sir uh, sorry to interrupt you uh, we are able to see first slide on this one yeah i am on the uh, sorry you are able to see the slide which is titled green energy transition no sir we are able to see relevance of uh, that is first slide first slide only is it yeah slide has it changed now no sir uh, if if it is a slide show we can we will be able to see that it's slide changed show. now no sir sorry is something wrong can you share it from your end i have sent the slide there uh, the presentation there oh yes yes sir we do it sir yes sir oh if you can share it from there shall yes, i unshare from uh, there ma'am can you Dev ma'am. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, ma'am, we will be sharing. One minute, let me remove. Uh, my presentation has gone. No, yes, you can share it from your end.
Yeah, it has come. Yeah, so that is the slide I was on. You are on this slide, no? Green energy transition needs a major rethink. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, yeah. So what I was telling was that uh, we have to increase our per capita energy consumption. Uh, and today, of course, our energy is mostly based on fossil energy, which leads to carbon dioxide emission. But now we have to increase our per capita energy consumption without increasing the emission, or for that matter, uh, emission you have to bring down to zero by 2070. Are you able to hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Shall I continue my lecture? Yes, yes sir. Oh, okay. So uh, now uh, the uh, you know this number here, that threshold which we should go. This is at around 2,400 kilogram oil, oil equivalent per person. Now. Uh, but as we make the transition, and uh, that will, you know, along with that transition, uh, one expects a significant improvement in the efficiency. And so for the same job, you probably will require lesser energy. So what is being said is that uh, instead of 2,400 kilogram oil equivalent uh, per person, uh, Probably the threshold, even at a threshold of around 1,400 kilogram oil equivalent per person, uh, we should be able to, to realize uh, the full human development index. And uh, now that along with the total population that you expect uh, India to have uh, by 2070, uh, would translate to something like 28,000 terawatt hours per year of the total energy equivalent. Now, this is what we will have to reach, and this is what we will have to reach realizing all clean energy production. Now, today, uh, our energy production is around 6,580 terawatt hour per year. And between now and 2070, if you have to go from 6580 to 28000 that corresponds to roughly a compound annual growth rate of 4.78% now this is what uh, is the transition that we are looking for and of course uh, we all think that you know uh, zero emission means renewable energy so there is a nice paper by professor sukhatme in current science which was published in 2012 and according to that uh, the total assessed renewable energy potential in india is around 5855 terawatt hour per year now this level can perhaps meet the current requirement which is around 6500 but it is way short of the total requirement that we have to reach 28,000 terawatt hour per year. And that is the challenge. While there may be additional renewable energy potential, particularly the potential from bioenergy, which is expected to be around 2,500 terawatt hours, in addition to what was accounted earlier, uh, which was only 60 terawatt hours. Uh, Per year but then uh, the gap between uh, the available renewable energy and the total energy that will require in 2070 is simply too large to bridge now the only other non emitting non carbon dioxide emitting source is nuclear and nuclear can of course meet our needs and thus it's inevitable for an optimum and uh, and stable grids, you know, because the renewable energies are variable energy sources. And you can't have a stable operation of the grid 
which anyway has to supply variable load. There is a load curve, daily load curve. And if you have also the generation, which is uh, not, uh, you know, it, it depends on how much sun is shining or whether it is shining or not. It depends on how much wind is, is blowing. And if you have to make sure that you have a stable grid under both variability on the supply side as well as demand side, then uh, then actually you need to add much more to the capacity you need to add to storage you need to have electronics to stabilize the grid so that means all, a lot of costs so uh, a kind of uh, dispatchable power generation of a significant magnitude is very important uh, for a stable grid operation and that's the importance of nuclear energy Next slide, please. Yeah, now it is in this context. Let us look at this transition. And I have uh, in the middle, you have this Sankey diagram, which has been drawn from uh, this document. The, uh, you know, there is a energy statistics India. Uh, which which is published uh, on the government uh, website. And uh, so I picked up the Sankey diagram from there. And then using these numbers, on the left-hand side is the supply side of the energy as it is today. On the right-hand side, it is the demand side, how, it, how the energy is used. And there are columns, one to say how it is being used uh, today. Other side is how you expect it to be, uh, you know, uh, as we go forward, uh, 2050 or so. And then uh, when we reach the net zero, 2070. Uh, the point to note is the clean energy resources, which constitute a very small fraction, maybe just 3.7 percent on the supply side uh, we'll have to see a very rapid increase by bringing in uh, uh, renewable energy hydro resources nuclear energy uh, to fulfill all the demand which is currently met by by crude oil natural gas and coal now on the uh, on the, that is on the supply side. On the demand side, uh, today, uh, you know, the of course, in the Sankey diagram, there are several uh, kind of demand usage have been identified. But if you aggregate that broadly into industrial use, into residential and agricultural use, and third, into the transportation uh, use, then uh, we are, uh, you know, in each one of them, uh, there is some energy being used as electricity. For example, in industry, around 5%, 4.7% is being uh, used as electricity, but a much larger fraction, 27%, for example, here is being used as thermal energy, you know, because processes require heat, steel making requires heat, and so on. Now on the on the residential and agriculture side again, uh, similarly there is around a significant portion of in, in energy, but also a much larger portion being used uh, as uh, as thermal, primarily for agricultural machinery, pumping, and and so on. Of course, some of the electricity is used also for pumping, uh, but also other uh, residential uses is primarily electrical commercial sector is primarily electrical and so on and then on the transport side today you know, most of it is thermal you know ic engines you provide uh, gasoline and diesel and uh, and run or or aviation kerosene for aircraft now uh, going forward uh, it's clear that uh, the share of electricity would go up uh, and then because of the thrust towards uh, net zero progressively uh, 
we can't use oil we can't use hydrocarbon gas coming from fossil energy so hydrogen ammonia and such derivatives uh, would start playing an important role uh, in supplying thermal energy to the industry and of course uh, that process will go even further uh, when it comes to uh, 2070 and maybe if all of it cannot be met by by clean and green energy then you may have to still use some part as uh, fossil energy but back it up by carbon capture and and sequestration on the residential and agricultural side again it looks to me that here biomass is an important resource and it's a significant resource as i mentioned earlier because earlier it was not known or realized that we can have this but now with the technology 2g technology for example Uh, the access to biomass and the quantum it can provide has become has become much larger uh, of course even so the share of electricity would go up and it would continue even further in 2070 when we go to green so there will be more electricity and of course uh, the the fuel supply would be mostly in the form of compressed biogas or other biofuels and so on and of course if we cannot meet all all of it stay uh, back sir uh, hello hello is that okay yes yes sir sir please please sir so uh, so that is in as far as the residential and agriculture sector and on the on the transportation hello there is some disturbance can can those who are not speaking can you mute please i i request all the participants to mute your mic yeah thank you so uh, the transportation today you know our transportation is primarily internal combustion engines tomorrow uh, it may become uh, electrical vehicles is a lot of emphasis on that and also there may be place for hydrogen hydrogen vehicles so this is an area where one is already one has started seeing a lot of lot of transformation now so what it means is that while there will be very rapid scale up of the clean energy resources on the supply side uh as an intermediate step i think we'll have to have significant emphasis on gas economy from oil or coal moving to gas because it it's required as a bridging fuel and on the on the demand side uh, you see a major transition uh, in different user segments with a significant increase in uh, use of electricity use of hydrogen and use of bioenergy because all of them won't emit net additional carbon dioxide so so the trend that we expect the energy mix that we need to adopt in my view would be or would need to be residential and agriculture sector uh, would be more of electricity plus biomass and which is roughly one third or little more than that uh, of the total energy use and uh, and this this mode is uh, preferred because uh, you know biomass you can generate on a decentralized basis it would give boost to rural economy and uh, only thing is we should allow these technologies related to biomass or for that matter any other energy conversion to be used in a technology ag agnostic way because you know different technologies are coming on the scene and let them compete in the marketplace and whichever uh, whichever succeeds will of course get adopted in a larger measure and there will be a diversity depending on the condition there may be preference for one technology or the other but we should have policies which allows all of them to be properly properly evolved 
on the industrial segment again electricity will go up hydrogen will go up but as i said the hydrocarbon use may still remain or for that matter even coal may be used there are industries uh, which uh, are kind of hard to abate uh, for example making of steel conversion of steel from coal to or coke to to hydrogen is a major transition and it will take some time and and so same thing is true with uh, with other segments where uh, one may need to resort to you know continue to use hydrocarbons or coal but back it up by carbon capture and utilization or carbon capture and sequestration so that the emission net emission is not there and transportation of course i think it will completely switch over from uh, the ic engines or hydrocarbon base to electricity and and hydrogen so that transition we see can we go to the next slide yeah now uh, so the put, is this is next slide or the one before one before sorry yeah this is the next slide now this is just data on biomass uh, just to show that biomass is not all that small as it looks and i said that we could have something like 2500 terawatt hours equivalent of biomass and all the references uh, are are given uh, there the biggest contributor here uh, is uh, is of course the uh, uh, the animal dung uh, and firewood this is uh, you know this is a today we are using this materials in the traditional way in rural areas but and that leads to air pollution and particulate matter and which is harmful for health of people but uh, we now have technologies to convert that into gas or even liquids clean fuels and we should allow this evolution of these technologies in a technology agnostic way and and make full use of this biomass and more particularly for the residential and agriculture sector because i can't imagine hydrogen going into kitchens because uh, there are some safety issues and i'm sure they will be solved but i think let them be addressed first for the industrial use and then go beyond can we go to the next slide yeah so the potential mega trends that one see are while total energy consumption would increase to four to five times uh, at a rate consistent with economic growth clean energy consumption would need to increase 80 times that is because uh, clean energy today is a very small fraction uh, as we saw between 3 and 4% and that uh, to reach 100% so that's a factor uh, of around 20 or 25 and then the overall energy has to go to four or five times so that is how we see a major scale up in clean energy use and that will happen at a rate consistent with reaching net zero because you know it in, it requires technology it in requires investments and there is a lot of work to be done and and we need to gear up because that is what will determine that rate the increase has to come primarily through renewable including bioenergy and nuclear as i said in the beginning except biomass biomass you can have both electricity but you can also use biomass for production of heat but except biomass all other clean energy sources they first produce electricity uh, there is a you know even solar energy nuclear energy wind energy uh, hydro energy they all produce electricity so you have to first produce electricity and then use it Uh, in a way we want to use it in the user segment there are of course possibilities for example solar thermal 
and high temperature nuclear reactors both of them are yet to be developed fully but they can directly produce high temperature heat and using that one can produce hydrogen by thermochemical splitting of water and in case of reactor you can also use radiation for causing some dissociation of water but this is the major characteristics of this transition that earlier it was to be thermal first then electricity and good part is used as thermal and some part 20% used as electricity now it is going to be electricity first and then uh, everything else we convert it to use it as electricity convert it to hydrogen and use um, for for the, the uh transport purposes or for heat purposes and of course uh, if you develop technology then of course you don't have to convert everything to electricity because some of the hydrogen can be produced without producing electricity but we must recognize this is the major feature of the clean energy transition the share of electricity would thus increase from current around 18% to around 35% if hydrogen is produced by thermochemical splitting stroke radiation dissociation of water that's i think is potentially cheaper option but if the technology is not developed at the right scale then the share of electricity may well become almost 80% uh, if, because then the hydrogen can be produced only through electrolysis and uh, and that uh, is something that uh, we need to factor in in our major clean energy transition so we need an optimum mix of electricity generating systems to assure diversity of supply optimum peak capacity investments and stability of grids because you know you can't afford to put uh, for it's a large electricity system you can't afford to put all eggs in the same basket so i think you need all of them you need solar you need wind you need nuclear you need hydro uh, you need hydrogen and so on next slide please now studies have shown that as one approaches net zero a mix relying primarily on nuclear energy is the most cost effective option to achieve decarbonization target uh the figure uh, in this slide is actually from uh, an oecd report uh, which uh, you know it's a three axis diagram the vertical axis is the cost of electricity the tariff and the two horizontal axis one is the share of how much uh, renewable energy and how much nuclear energy because we are talking about net zero and uh, the other horizontal axis is the how much of carbon dioxide emission you are tolerating uh, uh, in terms of you know grams emitted uh, per unit of electricity produced and as you go to the zero of uh, the origin of this figure you find there is a sudden peaking and that peaking is quite significant while the rest of it is all on a plateau now, there is a slope so there is slight difference but uh, nothing compared to this this peak and uh, the studies which have been done have shown that the minimum average generation cost as seen by the consumer at low emission that is you know closer to net zero uh and if you say that we want to have it all on renewable energy then that minimum generation cost would be twice in an electricity region in us the new england electricity region us and it will become four times in tbt region in china and if one looks at what should be the share of nuclear because you know we can't afford such high cost so we say yeah we want to reach optimum solution so at that optimum solution what is the expected share of nuclear and that is around 60% in the new england region of usa 
and around 80% in the TBT region of, of China. So this is an awareness which I think is extremely important. It's not there at an adequate measure. Uh, and uh, you know we there is a thinking that uh, everything can be managed by renewables. So first of all, I showed earlier that so much of renewable energy is not there. But even if you sort of get it from somewhere, uh, it's going to be much more expensive if you depend only on. And this is the point, you know. See, we at the generation, the producer of renewable energy, they produce renewable energy much cheaper, and we have seen that. But that is not the case in as far as the consumer end is concerned, because consumer end, you have to allow for transmission, you have to allow for balancing power, you have to allow for standard capacity, you have to allow for additional capacity investment in additional capacity to take care of the mismatch between the variability at the generation end and the variability at the at the load end and so on so even in india today our variable renewable energy uh, only 24.7 percent is in terms of in installed capacity and just 10 percent in terms of generation but there is a report of forum of regulators that brings out that surplus surplus standard capacity and resultant costs it's in the range of 1.34 1 rupee 334 paise per unit which is a matter of concern and similarly uh, the cost of balancing renewables has been estimated to be at around 1 rupee 10 paise by central electricity authority so, and in addition to that, uh, there is this uh, additional stranded capacity cost. So, even today, with a low level of penetration, we have to pay, the consumers have to pay around 2 rupees 12 paise additional charge in addition to whatever is the generation cost of uh, solar energy or, or wind energy. And that's an important point that we need to recognize next slide please so what should be the policy that india should adopt the key elements of suggested sustainable clean energy policy according to me would be number one electricity hydrogen and bioenergy these these are or these would be the three key key feeders for meeting energy demand and uh, you know earlier we used to say coal uh, crude oil gas will be the feeders today we have to generate electricity from clean sources we have to generate hydrogen from clean electricity or other clean sources and bioenergy and three have to be the key feeders of our energy demand i think we should reserve compressed biogas for cooking energy, whether in rural areas or in urban areas, bio CNG for running an agricultural machinery and strengthen rural economy. And as I said, this is a significant contributor, at least at the current level of energy use. We must emphasize decentralized renewables for rural and remote areas through microgrids interconnected to main grid and i think this um, the microgrids in rural areas or for that matter rooftops in urban areas have already been shown to be very promising and are becoming popular develop and deploy solar thermal and high temperature nuclear reactors for hydrogen production through thermochemical splitting and this, I, as I said, is important because that way you can produce hydrogen at a lower cost. And uh, this is a significant energy segment, around 15,000 terawatt hours of the energy segment of, out of a total of 28,000 terawatt hours, so roughly 50%. Now, we must augment electricity generation based on optimum mix of renewables, hydro and nuclear. And if you are able to do uh, direct production of hydrogen, as I mentioned above earlier, 
uh, then uh, our electricity system would have to be as large at around 10,000 terawatt hour per year. And if the hydrogen cannot be produced in the required quantity through direct then the electricity system would have to be even higher to bridge the shortfall in hydrogen production uh, through high temperature electrolysis. And then, of course, the balance, uh, if cannot be met through above means, uh, we need to leverage fossil energy and back it up with carbon capture and utilization. So that should be broadly the framework of our clean energy policy. Next one. Now, uh, I think this transition is all, you know, it sounds uh, uh, good uh, to narrate, but it's going to be very expensive. To get a feel of what kind of expense is involved, let's look at the cost of decarbonization of electricity grids in some countries. In the United States, for example, annual electricity production is around 4,000 billion units. Decarbonizing the United States power grid rapidly will cost around $4.5 trillion as per a study done by Wood Mackenzie. In Germany, the Germany's annual electricity production is around 650 billion units. The country is spending around $580 billion to overall its green overall its energy system towards green. Now, these are some kind of indicative numbers. India's electricity production today is around 1,600 billion units. And we must go uh, at least three to four times in uh, in business as usual mode and uh, we must grow another six to seven times to reach net zero because i told you that we need uh, more electricity in the net zero particularly to take care of hydrogen production so in that sense our electricity grids are going to be much much larger then uh, certainly we are already much larger than Germany today, but we'll become much larger even compared to compared to United States. And, and so in that sense, uh, if you want to now make a transition towards decarbonization, you can imagine the costs that are likely to be involved. And remember, these countries are rich countries we are we are poor countries so i leave it to your imagination and i have just put this indicative numbers but this is an expensive proposition unless we have the requisite resources financial resources this is not going to be possible next one so let me come to nuclear in that context that's the main thesis so having established that nuclear is a must uh, for uh, both because we don't have other resources and also for keeping the costs low uh, but then uh, our track record in terms of doing rapid growth of nuclear is is not all that large all that high so what is it that we need to do we need speedier and cost competitive nuclear capacity up addition as we approach net zero so you know today uh, the 700 megawatt phwrs which is the prime workhorse of our nuclear capacity addition uh, 10 units are being constructed in the fleet mode and we must speed up that construction process and also enhance the program beyond the currently approved the 10 fleet mode plus there are five more units which are under construction. So beyond this currently approved 15 units that are under construction, we should take up, in my view, at least additional three fleets of 10 units of 700 megawatt PHWR each. I must point out here that the nuclear reactors built in India, 
these are you know con completely consistent with atmanirbhar bharat we have our domestic capability and they have demonstrated globally competitive performance for example several of our heavy water reactors have shown uninterrupted run for years together i think at one stage we made a world record of around 962 days but more than a year year and a half most of our reactors show that performance for uninterrupted run even more important is the capital cost our specific capital cost per megawatt how much money you have to spend is actually roughly half of the similar number for imported units and so we must quickly build an enterprise which does tremendous value addition all value addition to be done in country because that's a wealth generation exercise you know we give a lot of emphasis for domestic production and here is one case where on one side we need energy to fuel our industrial capability capacity but at the same time this itself could be a source of wealth wealth creation in addition we should expedite plant capacity addition through imported light water re reactors and if necessary if this, that doesn't progress well reallocate the sites to phwrs because that is what would be the workhorse we should pursue export of our phwrs because that gives uh, some balancing uh, capacity to our industry and you know the continuity of work is extremely important and also uh, being an export market it actually kind of uh, puts to test our uh, uh, our efficiency of production efficiency of performance uh, commercial efficiency and, and and so on and uh, in addition to this larger reactors i think we should also co develop factory assembled small modular reactors with industry for deployment in ppp mode at sites vacated by retiring coal plants we will have plenty of sites where coal plants were operating and now they have to be closed down now these sites may not be able to accommodate large reactors but uh, if you have the small modular reactor with adequate safety then we can very well use them to be located at such location so that is the way uh, we should put on the technology side and of course on the management side and administrative side we should have better project management structures so so this is one part of giving thrust to the to the program next slide please now uh, reaching 2070 reaching net zero by that time is not an end in itself we will have to keep finding energy resources which are non emitting from all time thereafter and uh, so we need uh, many many sources so i think the famous three stage nuclear power program which uh, we have been pursuing which involves setting up fast builder reactors which involves setting up thorium reactors and also going forward which involves setting up fusion reactors that's an ongoing development program and we should speed that up uh, these are the pictures of some of the indian uh, development program and i think we should accelerate that as well as we sort of enhance the domestic capacity addition for the immediate time frame so nuclear is necessary for adequate long term clean energy supply initially fission energy but followed by fusion energy a number of new technologies both for reactors as well as fuel cycle they need to be developed and the user and appliances because you know as i said everything will be produced initially as electricity or some of it as hydrogen so the user and appliances also have to change to support the green economy so it's a major technology challenge develop new technologies even while accelerating the approach to net zero for sustainable and cost competitive energy security next slide 
now as i said uh, while the energy production uh, is one thing but we also need many other technologies to support this overall transition for example technology of steam electrolysis and also solid oxide fuel cell because that is what will allow cheap production of hydrogen technology for thermochemical splitting of water which i mentioned and also radiolysis to be explored battery or other forms of energy storage particularly thermal storage in case of solar thermal or for that matter even in nuclear uh, the way the bill gates reactor is visualizing is important production of hydrocarbon substitutes uh, using hydrogen and biomass that will be another you know you can't use fossil energy whenever it emits carbon dioxide but you would require um, the the petrochemicals or hydrocarbon chemicals in in a variety of form for a variety of uses and uh, so that's whole thing will see a major transformation and of course ccus related technologies next one now india has done well in ccu technologies and uh, i will not go deep into this but for example there is this uh, demo facility for gas based fermentation to produce around 40 million liters of ethanol uh, starting from flue gas and uh, then there is also a joint research project between indian oil corporation department of biotechnology and lanzatech uh they have produced an integrated carbon capture utilization process to convert carbon dioxide into commercial grade omega 3 fatty acid esters and biodiesel and uh, so that uh, same thing uh, lanzatech india lanzatech india glycol and unilever they have announced the launch of world's first laundry capsule in the market made from industrial carbon emissions and then there are of course possibilities in terms of chemical absorption enhanced oil recovery and and so on but uh, the total carbon dioxide that one is talking about is so large that even if you build large industrial scale capacities on this i think the quantity of carbon dioxide that we need to deal with is much much larger and it is in that context that we will have to be somewhat careful in terms of depending too much on fossil energy next slide now uh, you know this is a major technology program and uh, as i said uh, the success of this program will depend on technology and finance and you need to develop you know this is concurrently worldwide this development is going on and so it's not as if we can afford to wait for world to develop and then bring first of all it will cost us dear and uh, i think we have for example we all talk about our uh, demographic dividend lot of young competent youth so i think all that should be leveraged to create an ecosystem for technology leadership sufficient insights for vendor independent autonomous decision making uh, this this is an important element of the technology leadership today our decision making is dependent on the vendors coming and making presentations to us and our making a selection very much the way we go to a shop to buy things see different alternatives and make our choices i think uh, we should get away from this vendor buyer syndrome and decide what we want to do and and make it um, make in india made in india you know design in india everything indigenous atmanirbhar bharat that's very important and for that we need to have connections ability to connect basic research applications proof of concept technology and commercial deployment you know these are all require different skills different people but we, they should be a part of a common ecosystem so they may be diverse groups 
but they must interact with each other with their complementary skills work together with uh, you know in as a as a whole and then only you can you can realize uh, this uh, translation chain and then of course uh, there must be a synergistic top down bottom up approach from top the vision document the policy statement should visualize which way we are going and have the right policies right articulation of the uh, of the vision but then uh, that cannot go into the micro details i think it's best to leave micro details to the working level specialists to build and apply their own innovative ideas and it is this combination that i think is very important so the india energy vision should be an integrated plan on sustainability economy and markets foresights and policy implementation and leave the the detail concepts uh, to the people uh, at the grassroots or people at the working working level next one so i stop here and i thank you for your uh, patient hearing and if there are any questions i'll be very happy to answer thank you Uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, the very informative session, and uh, um, thank you for spending your valuable time and sharing the knowledge. Uh, and uh, special thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. Thank you. And any questions from participants? Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, sir. Which is the country which is taking leadership in this field? What are your discussions? Which country? Sorry, your your yes, sir. The yes, sound sir. is breaking. Can you? Uh, which repeat? country is a role model in this? Whatever you have presented, no, sir. But we can take that model. Which are... Well, I think I. Uh, well, I'll answer that in two parts. You know, most of the advanced countries, they have their own technologies in these areas. And if they don't have, they are working on development of these technologies. So uh, you take most of the advanced countries and they have made a lot of progress in these areas. Now, uh, I think for us, we should develop our own model. You know, we should give away that tendency of copying somebody. You know, if you look for somebody as a role model, that means you decide that you will only follow them, follow somebody. And if you are a follower, you can be at best number two. You can never be number one. Now, India is a large country and our ambition should be number one country in the world. The way China is moving forward. You know, at one stage, China was uh, comparable or for that matter, India was superior in some respects. Today, where is China gone? They don't worry about any role model. They have their own model. So I think uh, we should get away from that mindset that we should copy somebody. That copycat mentality is what is keeping us behind and what is preventing us from taking bold decisions. So we should uh, we should do this you know uh, and there are examples there are examples in atomic energy there are examples in space program there are examples in missile development program where uh, we interact with the world we know what is happening and elsewhere we cooperate where wherever they are willing to cooperate but we decide our program we pursue our own model and that is how we you know all high tech whether it is atomic and i said nuclear reactors are cheaper in india same thing is true with the space uh, our space probes mangalyan chandrayaan they all been much lower cost than similar programs of other countries so my strong suggestion is that we should not look for role models we should give away that mentality okay okay sir thank you very much Thank you. Still any questions?
I think there are no other questions. We can hmm. close. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can write that down. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, we can wind up the session, I think. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, thank you all for uh, attending this session. Thank you. Thank you. So I log out now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you.